Ruby often went to the cemetery. Here, in silence and tranquility, she could confide all her thoughts and worries, sitting by her mom's grave. The girl talked, talked about something, looking nowhere, and as if it became easier, as if her mother heard her, invisibly protected her, calmed her, gave her strength. Her mother died when Ruby was only ten years old. It was hard for the little girl to bear the loss, and she even now, when she is more than twenty years old, carried that pain in her soul. It was only when she went to her mother's grave that she found comfort. Once a month Ruby went to the graveyard, even in winter. Her father knew about it. At first he fought, afraid for his daughter's mental health. Then he realized there seemed to be no harm in such visits. He calmed down. Dad calmed down quickly after Mom's death. A year later, he was married. Ruby didn't accept this strange woman at first. But then her heart went out to Aunt Sarah. She even tried to call her Mom. She didn't know why. Only Sarah stopped that timid attempt. What kind of mother am I to you? She said sternly. My name is Mrs. Sarah. And Ruby, her eyes wide with fear, nodded in agreement. Really, what was it with her? She had only ever had one mom. Then she'd sobbed and apologized to her mom at her grave. For betrayal, sort of. There's silence all around. The autumn sun was shining softly. And then a maple leaf flew onto the girl's head. It fell softly on the top of her head, as if stroked it, as if her mother had touched it with her hand. The girl realized that her mother had forgiven her, and maybe she was not offended. Many years have passed since then. After school, Ruby graduated from an economic university and got a job in a trading firm. That's where she met her future husband. Hugh worked in the planning department. Things got really fast between them. And soon Hugh proposed to Ruby. The first person she shared this joy with was her mother. On that summer Sunday afternoon, Ruby sat at the grave and told her mother that she would soon be married. No one said anything back to her, of course, but she wasn't expecting any sign. Okay, mommy, I'll go, Ruby said with a smile. I'm sorry I don't come to see you more and more often. I have so much to do. No offense, my dear. Next time I'll be sure to come with Hugh. You'll see how good he is. Just then, a magpie chirped sharply nearby. Ruby was startled by the sound. She looked around for the bully, and it was as if she'd been waiting for it. A magpie flew down from the branch of a birch tree near the neighboring fence and flew noisily over the girl's head. Ruby paid no attention to the sign. At home, she told her father and Sarah that she was to be married soon. Where will you live? She asked her stepmother. As far as I know, your Hugh is a stranger. No, Ruby, I don't mean anything by it, but it's only a two-room apartment. Cramped, but not cramped. With a meaningful glance at his wife, Mr. Boris said, Yes, but Hugh's renting an apartment now. I'm going to go and live with him. And then we'll take out a mortgage, Ruby replied. That's such a bondage. Sarah gasped. What are you going to live on? Mrs. Sarah, we'll manage, and we'll help you. Dad nodded emphatically. We will, Sar agreed. Ruby only smiled. No. In the years that Sar had lived with them, she had grown accustomed to her and didn't even take offense at her caustic remarks and subtextual words. In fact, her stepmother was not a bad woman and even unhappy in some ways. After all, she had never been able to give birth to a child of her own. Ruby was not a bad woman, and perhaps she even regretted the phrase she had once used about her mother. But the subject never came up again, and so for her she remained only Mrs. Sarah, her father's wife. She and Dad got along well, thank God. And the wedding? Sarah came to her senses. We'll have to order a dress, choose a restaurant, a toastmaster, a photographer. Oh, there's so much to worry about. Hugh and I have decided to keep it simple. We'll just get married and that's it. Ruby shrugged. Why all the expense? I mean, I understand the wedding, it's expensive. But it just doesn't seem human, Dad muttered. Ruby shook her head and said nothing. Of course, like any girl, she wanted the dress, the restaurant, and the fun. But Hugh had convinced her that it was all unnecessary. They needed the money for the mortgage now. Less than a month later, Ruby and Hugh were married. Hugh was an enviable groom. What can I hide? He was good-looking, courteous, attentive, and intelligent and he had a good job, too. Ruby was stuck in the economics department as an accountant. Hugh was soon to be head of the planning department. Sarah and Boris came to the registry office to congratulate the young couple. They insisted on going to the restaurant, where they had already booked a table. 
The newlyweds had nothing to do. They agreed. And already in the restaurant, Boris started talking about the mortgage, asked how much is needed for a down payment, and then handed out an envelope. This is from my mother and me. A little embarrassed, he said. You see where to spend it for the down payment or for your own needs. In short, our wedding present. Thank you, Daddy, Ruby exclaimed and was immediately embarrassed. Why? I know you don't have much of a pension yourself. We do it ourselves. Daddy knows more. Take it, Boris said decisively and looked into his son-in-law's eyes. And you, Hugh, don't hurt my daughter. She's the only one I have. I won't forgive you if you make her cry. No, Mr. Boris. I love Ruby. I promise I'll make her the happiest she'll ever be. Hugh promised and held Ruby close to him. She was glowing with happiness. A little time passed and Hugh and Ruby were able to take out a mortgage and moved out of their rented accommodation and into their own apartment. And their quiet family life began. During all these changes, Ruby suddenly forgot all about going to see her mother at the cemetery. Somehow she remembered. It was embarrassing. She asked Hugh to go to the graveyard with her next weekend. But her husband reacted violently. Ruby, you've got to live in the present. How long can you torture yourself with this loss? And your mom's not in the cemetery? You know that. Well, it's kind of a ritual for me, Ruby said, justifying herself. Is that a bad thing? I don't know, but I don't want to go there, Hugh replied. And that night Ruby suddenly dreamed of her mother just as she remembered her from her childhood, young, with a slim waist and long blonde hair. Her mother stood as if in a fog, looking at her intently. She wanted to rush to her, but her mom shook her head, turned and walked away. Then she turned around again and pointed somewhere to the side. Ruby looks over there, and there's Hugh, cheerful and contented. Mommy shook her head again and suddenly disappeared into the mist. Ruby woke up with a strange uneasiness, but then she thought it was a dream. It was just her mother telling her who she should be with. Yes, Hugh was right. The past must be let go. Ruby and Hugh had been living together for just over a year. She was still working in her accountant's office. He, on the other hand, was doing well. Hugh, as expected, was already the head of the department. Frequent business trips, office meetings. It was a rare day he and Ruby could have lunch together. Hugh came home late and tired. Ruby tried to please her husband in everything. A delicious dinner perfect order, and attention. Hugh liked this state of affairs. You are my gold, not my wife, he said with a smile as he hugged Ruby, and she in return snuggling up to her husband. Yes, they seemed happy, and only one thought troubled Ruby more and more. She still couldn't get pregnant. She kept going to the doctor. She hoped for a miracle. But it didn't. Then one day, something happened that turned their whole family life upside down. It was a Sunday afternoon and Ruby and Hugh had decided to spend it at home. Ruby had made some cakes. She and her husband were in the living room watching a movie. Or rather, he was watching with interest and she was pretending to be fascinated by the story. In fact, Ruby would have watched some melodrama right now, but she didn't want to argue with her husband. The doorbell rang. Ruby looked at her husband questioningly and he folded his arms for this would be the climax. She sighed, smiled, and went to open the door. On the landing stood a pretty young woman, simply dressed, her pigtail over her shoulder, just like a real girl from the backwoods. Only the girl was deeply pregnant, seven months no less. Who do you want? Ruby was surprised. Does Hugh live here? The stranger asked shyly. He does. Who are you? Me? The girl was embarrassed. Then she put her hand to her stomach. I'd like to talk to him. A terrible guess burned Ruby. How she wished she were wrong. Just then Hugh came out of the parlor. There was an incomprehensible exclamation. Ruby, bewildered, turned toward her husband. Hugh, who is that? Is it? I don't know. He mumbled. Girl, who are you? The stranger widened her eyes in surprise and then her cheeks flushed. Hugh, she said angrily. I am the mother of your unborn child. We're going to have a daughter, by the way. A daughter? Ruby gasped. Oh, darling, don't you listen to some hustler? Hugh got worried. I don't know her at all. You don't? Well, let's get reacquainted. I'm Lana, your classmate. You came to our village eight months ago to visit your mother. You met me on the street. We're going to compliment each other. And then you came to see me in the evening. Do you want to tell me the rest of the story or do you remember? 
Ruby stood there as if a bucket of cold water had been poured on her. She remembered that eight months ago Hugh had traveled to her homeland. He had a mother who lived in a remote village. Ruby had never seen her. Hugh had said she was ill and that was why she didn't visit. Ruby wanted to go with him then, but her husband talked her out of it, saying that it was a long way. There was no comfort in the village. And Ruby had the annual report at work. And Hugh had to get back to his native country for work. So he made the best of a bad situation. Only Ruby never thought it would turn out like this. Hugh, let the girl go into the apartment and get some rest. Suddenly, unexpectedly, even for herself, Ruby said. Her husband looked at her with a wild look. Then suddenly he grinned. Well, let her go, if that's the case. Ruby stepped aside, and Lana stepped through, her belly hitting her lightly. Where to? she asked. To the kitchen. You don't have to take your shoes off, Ruby answered casually. I wasn't going to. Lana grinned. As you can see, I'm not very handy. In the kitchen, Ruby poured tea for her guest and sat her down at the table. Then she sat down next to her. Hugh stood in the doorway with his arms crossed. He was visibly nervous. Ruby, surprisingly, was calm. Her upbringing did not allow her to behave aggressively with a pregnant woman, even if she was her husband's mistress. Mistress. It was a little wild for Ruby to realize that. She couldn't believe her husband had betrayed her, but at the same time Lana's words sounded convincing, and Hugh suddenly stopped shouting that he didn't know this girl. Ruby set a cup of tea down for her guest. Have some, she said. Here are some cakes. Lana nodded and took a bite of the cabbage pie, sipping her tea. Delicious, Lana said and smiled shyly. I'm sorry I'm so upset, but I don't know what to do. She was getting more and more embarrassed by the minute, apparently by the trip here. It had been a momentary impulse and now she didn't know what to do next, and Hugh remained silent. Ruby was confused, too, and Lana fell silent. The silence was dragging on. So you're sure that your child is Hugh's? Ruby finally managed to utter the phrase that was so terrifying to her. Of course I am. Lana shrugged her shoulders and added artlessly. I had no others at that time. What a village! Hugh spoke up. I didn't have any at that time. You have such things going on in that village. Why did you do it? Lana said softly, but reproachfully. You know it's not true. Normal people live in our village, and I cannot with every person I meet. And you and I were friends at school, but then we broke up. You went to your town and I stayed. I even managed to get married, but it didn't work out. And then I saw you and it was like I went crazy. I knew you were married, your mom told me, but I couldn't resist. When you left, I even sighed with relief. And then I felt something was wrong with me. The doctor at the neighborhood clinic said it was five weeks. He asked me if I should keep it. How else could I? It's a baby. It's alive. It's a sin to get rid of it. Isn't it a sin to be with another man's husband? Ruby asked gloomily. I'm sorry. Lana lowered her eyes. Ruby sighed. I realize that my coming here is a bit of a shock to you. I didn't mean for it to happen like this. I would never have told Hugh I was carrying his child. But things happened in my life. I lived with my mom. She was my rock and my support. She died a month ago and I'm all alone. I'm afraid that I won't be able to raise a child on my own. So I decided to let my own father know that he was going to have a daughter. Hugh mumbled something unintelligible again. Ruby sat stony-faced, staring at one point. Then she took another look at her guest. In fact, the unfortunate woman was about to become a mother. Yes, she was confused. And which of them was more to blame? Ruby didn't care at all. But after all, the woman was carrying Hugh's child, if she could be believed, and she could be believed. Ruby could feel it. What should I do? Well, I'll go. Now you know everything, Hugh. There's nothing for me to do here. Lana finished her pie and hurried out, leaving her phone number on the table. She said she was going to the village, and when she gave birth, she'd let me know. Ruby got up, walked her to the door, and then returned to the kitchen. A bottle of brandy was already on the table. Hugh sat at the table with his head down. Are you celebrating your future fatherhood? Ruby asked with a tremor in her voice. Hugh, do you realize what you've done? He raised his head, looked at her with a cloudy look, grinned. I don't understand why you believe that, Hen, he said angrily. You weren't even paying any attention to me. All your attention was on her. But you had something with her. I did. 
Hugh snorted drunkenly. I love you. You betrayed me. Don't exaggerate. What exactly happened? Nothing. I was out there alone, reminiscing about my youth and all that. It wasn't cheating, it was just a call of nature. A call of nature? Hugh, I'm going to stay with my father. I'm having trouble being in the same apartment with you right now. Ruby headed for the door, picking up the phone number Lana had left. She said she'd let us know. We didn't give her our numbers. Or does she know your number? She does. Hugh shrugged and poured himself another drink. What's she doing here? Couldn't you call me? I wanted to make you happy, Ruby shouted. And me too. Tears sprang from her eyes and she stormed out of the kitchen. In a hurry she gathered some things and ran out of the apartment without saying goodbye to her husband. I couldn't see him anymore. He behaved as if he had been offended. Seeing his daughter on the threshold of his apartment, Boris frowned. Did he hurt you? If only he had. Ruby sobbed and threw herself on her father's neck. Usually Ruby was reserved in her feelings, but here she was hysterical. She told her father about her husband's infidelity, about her pregnant mistress. Boris listened and grew increasingly gloomy. Sarah also stood beside him and only sighed and shook her head. Divorce the bastard, father finally said. Papa, but I love him, Ruby said through her tears, and we had a normal life before. We were fine. But he cheated on you, and there's no telling how many of them he's had. Sarah joined the conversation. Boris, wait, don't be so hard on yourself. Life happens. We need to calm down, you and me both. Yeah, Hugh made a mess of things. But aren't you guys all like that? I've never cheated on you once in my life. Boris is blushing with indignation. I believe you. But remember how we started living with you. You buried your wife. It hadn't even been a year since you brought me home. You think it was easy for Ruby? The neighbors were talking about all kinds of things. Sarah, this is different. Yeah, it's different. But what I'm saying is, you can't make everything into one pattern, even if Hugh was unfaithful. And the baby's his. It doesn't mean Ruby has to ruin her family life. Boris just waved and went into the living room. Sarah gave Ruby tea in the kitchen, then took her to her room. Ruby fell on the bed and fell into a heavy sleep. In the morning she realized where she had to go, to her mother's grave. There her thoughts would settle, and there she would find the right solution. Ruby called work, and citing illness. She decided to spend the day alone, in silence. The young woman sat at her mother's grave and mentally recited all that she had accumulated in her soul. She believed that her mother could hear her. The weather was clear and sunny. August was winding down. A light breeze caressed her hair as if to calm her. Mom looked from the monument, so sweet and beautiful. Mommy, how can I forgive him? Ruby whispered. And should I? If only Mommy had said something or given her a sign. Ruby sincerely believed that such a thing was possible. But nothing. Ruby thought back to her childhood, her youth, when she married Hugh. And even though it had been modest. But the feelings were real. Or was it? I couldn't find the answer. Ruby stood up, sighed heavily, and walked away. Just then, at the cemetery gate, she ran into a middle-aged woman and a boy of about ten. Come, Sonny, let's go to your grandmother and put some flowers on her grave, the woman said, hearing that. Ruby froze. She looked at the two of them and realized how she should live her life. The most important thing to a woman is a child and it wasn't her but pregnant Lana who should be thinking about that right now. After all, Lana was a grown woman and was also aware of her actions. Let her have the baby, but Ruby needs to think about herself. It was high time she went to the doctor and figured out why she wasn't getting her long-awaited pregnancy. Ruby was sure that the doctors will figure it out, prescribe the right treatment, and she herself will have a little baby. And then nothing could destroy her family. And a child with a mistress? Let it be born. She'll take the girl as Hugh's daughter and send her presents. What can she do about it? It's not the child's fault. But the important thing now is to get her health sorted out. Yes, she must have a baby of her own. Hugh opened the door to Ruby's father's apartment. He had flowers in his hands. They stood looking at each other in silence. And then Hugh fell to his knees. Ruby, darling, I'm sorry. Literally pleaded with her husband. I can't go on without you. I swear to you that connection with Lana was some kind of obsession. 
I'm ashamed. Yes, I can't change anything, but I don't want to lose you. Hugh, get up, don't. Ruby said quietly. What can we do now? It's just the way it is. We'll move on. So you forgive me. I do. Hugh jump it up, handed her the flowers, hug at her, and Ruby huddle it against her husband, thinking that everything would work out. We love each other. Hugh. I was thinking it's time we went to the hospital. At least for me. She raised her head and looked questioningly at her husband. Are you really ill? The girls in accounting told me at the office that you were sick. No, I just said that. That's not the point. I think it's time we had a baby. Sweetheart, of course. Hugh smiled. It's all I've ever dreamed of. And Lana's baby. Don't think I don't want one. Don't say that. She frowned. It's not the baby's fault. We'll help that baby, too. And when we have our baby, they'll be able to communicate. How wise you are, Hugh said admiringly, and held Ruby close to him again. How happy I am to have you as my wife. While they reconciled, Boris and Sarah sat patiently in the kitchen. Then they called the lovers to tea. Once again there was complete understanding between them. Peace and happiness. A few days later Ruby was able to get an appointment with the doctor. Endless examinations began, and soon the attending doctor reported a disappointing diagnosis. The chances of her becoming a mother were practically non-existent. The young woman could not believe it. How? Why? Why? There were many questions, and almost no answers. Ruby told Hugh about the doctor's verdict. Then we'll live for each other. He replied comfortingly. That's easy for you to say. You're going to have a baby soon. What about me? I'm empty, you know. Empty, Ruby cried. Don't say that. And you had to bring up Lana again. Hugh frowned. It's just a point. I don't need anyone but you. Ruby clung to her husband's shoulder. He stroked at her heed like a little girl. Some time later, Lana called to tell them that she had given birth to a daughter. Name it her Julia. Ruby hated and hurt to hear it, especially now that she couldn't have children of her own. But she didn't let it get to her. She even bought various baby things herself and sent them by parcel to the village. And she'd convinced Hugh to send Lana some money. Why would she do that? Hugh was indignant. Not for her, for the baby, Ruby replied. She paused and added, Why don't you go yourself? What? Yes, of course she was uncomfortable with such a suggestion, but it was not for her feelings. Hugh, however, only grinned. That's the last thing we need, he said. Let her take care of the girl and thank me for helping her in this way. These words hurt Ruby. She should be glad her husband was still around. But Hugh was too neglectful of his child. Three years passed. During that time, Hugh had never once traveled to his homeland. Ruby had hinted several times that he should go and see his mother. And I'll come with you. To which Hugh sharply replied that there was nothing for them to do. Hugh's mother, Mrs. Catherine, called occasionally, mostly talking to her son. Ruby only said hello, and Ruby would say hello back. For some reason, Hugh was against their socializing. It puzzled Ruby at first, but then she let it go. One day Catherine called Hugh in the evening. He'd just laid down to rest after dinner, and there it was. Yes, mother, I'm listening, he said in surprise. Why are you calling so late? Katerina said something to her son, and his eyebrows crept higher and higher. Can't you sit with her? he said sharply into the phone. This is your granddaughter, after all. I've got work to do, you know? Can't you pull yourself together for a week? He pressed the disconnect button with irritation and looked at Ruby, who sat beside him, and looked questioningly at her husband. Can you believe it? My mom calls and says Lana's going into labor again. Well, that certainly can't be yours. They got a little tense. You've never been there, as far as I know. Of course I haven't. But that's not the point. Lana got married. She has a legitimate husband. And my mother recognized her granddaughter, and she's babysitting her. So Lana's going to the hospital. She asked her mom to watch Julia, but I don't think she's going to be able to. Why not? She's got health problems. Hugh's confused. You didn't tell me. What's this all about? Well, my mom suggested that Lana send the girl to us for a while. And Lana said yes? She did. Ruby shrugged. You don't have to ask us. That's what I'm saying. They practically said, Come and get your daughter. She's yours. Wait, what about the husband? You said she got married. Why can't he take care of the baby? Who knows? They all seem to be the same breed. What kind? 
A drinker. You never told me that? Ruby raised her eyebrows. What's there to brag about? Hugh replied gloomily. Yeah, my mom's been drinking her whole life. And Lana, I understand, has started drinking too. And she's found a husband to match. God, why didn't you say something? Ruby exclaimed. Do you realize what kind of conditions the child is living in? Of course we should go and take her back to our house. And thought. Maybe forever. Hugh did not immediately agree with his wife's arguments, but Ruby was able to persuade him, and the next day they took time off work and went to the village by car. It was a long drive of about ten hours. She had a lot on her mind. How would she meet with Lana, with Katerina? And most importantly, how would the girl react to being taken away from her native home? For a while, of course. But it was still stressful for the child. Ruby thought more and more about Julia, and was surprised to realize that she already wanted to take the girl in her arms, to hold her close to her. Even though it was another woman's child, it was Hugh's daughter, and therefore she was no stranger to her. They arrived at the village when night had fallen. The car drove down an overgrown dirt road and stopped at a ramshackle cabin. The light was still on in the window. Is this where your mother lives? Ruby was surprised and looked at her husband reproachfully. Hugh, your mother lives in such poverty, and you haven't helped her? And I am good. I wish I'd thought once about what it's like for her here. I'll have to fix the fence tomorrow. Look, it's falling apart. It's not falling apart. That's not the point. Hugh grinned. What's that? Ruby was surprised again. It's like this. You'll see for yourself since you asked to come here. You have no idea what my childhood was like. And then Ruby wondered. Hugh had never really told her much about his childhood. Only a few memories of school, how he managed to enter the budget and go to the city, how he worked and studied there at the same time. They thought Hugh just wanted to be on his own. And from this he became a bit callous towards his relatives. But it turned out that it was just life that made him be that way. They got out of the car, Ruby looking around warily. It was dark. An owl screeching somewhere a dog howling in the next street. There was a lot of weeds around. Do people even live in this village? She asked. Living or living? It depends. Her husband shrugged. Let's go. He stepped onto the path to the house and Ruby followed him. The old wooden door creaked open. A familiar smell hit their noses. They cringed. What a stench, Ruby burst out. This is how my mother lives. Hugh grinned bitterly. He knocked for good measure and immediately opened the door. Ruby saw the kitchen, which they had entered from the hay. It was so filthy that it was impossible to tell. A mountain of unwashed dishes on the table, a flooded floor, a battery of empty bottles against the wall. The lights were on all over the house. Mother, where are you? Hugh called out. Somewhere in the back of the house there was some mooing, then a grunt, and soon an unpleasant-looking woman of indeterminate age appeared at the door. It was Katerina, Hugh's mother. Sonny's here. The woman smiled drunkenly. Oh, I wasn't expecting you. Why's that? I told you I was coming. And not alone, with my wife. That's my Ruby. Hugh looked at his wife, apologizing. That's my mom. Yes, I am. Katerina smiled stupidly. And you are Ruby. At last we see each other. Katerina, breathing on Ruby's breath, went to hug and kiss. She wrinkled her nose involuntarily. Mother, stop it. Hugh shouted at her. Why are you drunk again? What's wrong with me? Just a little, the woman mumbled. I just got my pension yesterday. I drank it all. I knew my son was coming at least clean it up. Why are you shaming your mother? Let your wife clean up. At least she'll do something for a sick old woman. A sick old woman? Mother. Are you talking about yourself? All right, that's enough. Where does Lana live? Same place. Where else would she be? Across the garden from us. But don't go to her now. Nicola, her man, is there. I know he's her man. You told me so yourself. You also told me to come and get the baby. Me? Katerina stared at her son. The mother scratched the back of her head, remembering. Exactly. There was a case. Lana has to go to the maternity hospital one of these days. Who will look after this girl? I'm sick. What about you? You're the father. I'm sorry, but you're my son, my father. Katerina giggled stupidly. 
Ruby was sick of being in the house and said she was going to sleep in the car. Katerina yelled something else at her. She seemed offended that her daughter-in-law had spoken to her so dryly, but Ruby didn't want to hear anything more. She lay down in the car in the back seat and remembered her mom. The image of her mom was a little blurred, as if in a fog, but she still knew she was sweet, kind, beautiful. She remembered how she baked pies on weekends, how she braided her pigtails before school, how she kissed her on the top of her head, and she always smelled nice, like cinnamon or vanilla. Her mom worked in a candy store. She and her dad had a good life, and then all of a sudden she got sick. Mom was gone in three months. Ruby's heart clenched at the bitter memories. Why did everything hurt so much? And then she thought back to the woman she'd just seen. She was hardly even a woman. And she's a mother. And he's a good man. My husband, Ruby thought. Not broken, not down. He'd gotten out of this cloaca and become a man. Then she remembered why she had come here in the first place. How her husband's little girl lived here. So she sees her grandmother like this. It's disgraceful. I hope Lana has enough sense not to let the child alone to this aunt. Ruby had a thought. She saw Hughes come out of the house and head for the car. The mamma's going to all sorts of trouble, too, he said as he got into the driver's seat. Last time you could sleep at home, but now you can't. A real bum. We'll spend the night in the car, and in the morning we'll go to Lana's to pick up the girl. Hugh, how long has your mom been drinking? Ruby asked quietly. A long time. Hugh sighed heavily. He said he was about seven years old when his father went north to work and found someone else. His mother drank herself to death. And so it went on all his life. When Hugh was in school he was taken to an orphanage a few times, but he ran away because he was abused there. In the end guardianship gave up, and Hugh set a goal for himself in school to go to the city. To do this, he began to study hard. Well past the final exams, was able to enter and study. He got a good job and he was on his way up. Then he met Ruby. Why didn't you ever tell me any of this? Ruby asked sympathetically. What was there to brag about? I was always ashamed of my mother, and I am now. I knew how fond you were of your mother's memory. Well, maybe she could be coded. How many times has she been coded? When I was in high school, Social Security took her to treatment several times. Every time she fell off the wagon and started drinking even more. That's how she lives. It's sad. Poor me. I didn't know anything, Ruby whispered and stroked her husband's head. Oh, it's all right. Let him live the life he wants. I'm lucky I met you. He kissed her hand, and they talked some more and fell asleep. As dawn broke, Ruby opened her eyes. Hugh was asleep, leaning back a little in the driver's seat. It had been quite a night. Every joint seemed to ache from the uncomfortable position. Ruby stretched, yawned. Hugh stirred. He yawned noisily and turned to Ruby. How did you sleep? He asked with a smile. You don't say. Ruby grinned. Not at all. That's right. Let's go get the girl, shall we? Yeah, let's go get your daughter. Aren't you going to visit your mom? Why? You saw the whole thing yesterday. And please don't call that girl my daughter. I don't feel comfortable with that. Hugh, she's your daughter. And there's one more thing. We hadn't really thought about it. I mean, we'd have to go somewhere here like the guardianship office or the administration office. We'd have to get a paper saying that Lana's loaning her daughter to us. Otherwise, how are we going to explain why we're keeping her? What if she has to go to the hospital? You've already decided she's going to stay with us, haven't you? A week at the most. There's another thing. We both work. You'll probably have to take a week's vacation on your own time. Yeah, I think so too. Ruby agreed but we still need some kind of paper that the child will stay with us. We'll figure it out. Hugh nodded. He started the car and they drove to another street. Ruby looked out of the window at the village and only wondered at the poverty and ruin, the abandoned and neglected farmsteads, weeds everywhere. But there used to be a good village here, people lived here, but then they all ran away. The only people left are those who have nowhere to go, or no desire to change anything in their lives. And this is where the little girl lives, is there even a kindergarten or a school here? She asked her husband in confusion. What do you mean? Hugh shook his head. They closed it all down a long time ago. I finished my schooling in the neighboring village. They used to bus us to school. And the kindergarten? There never was one. The only civilization left here is a store. 
He nodded toward a ramshackle building with a barn lock on the door. That's the store? It's horrible. Do they sell anything there? Bread, matches. People take a shuttle bus to the district center for groceries. How can you live here? And the medical center? What if you get sick? Medical center? I think they closed the medical center too. The old paramedic died, and the new specialists won't go to such a remote area. There's an ambulance for sick people. Or you can take a bus or a car to the hospital. How do people live here? They don't live. They live to see the end of their lives. Hugh answered gloomily. It's their own fault. My mother, for instance, if she hadn't been drinking, she'd have moved to the central estate a long time ago. They offered her a house in the neighboring village for free a few years ago. She just had to renovate it. She didn't want it. And you knew and you didn't help? Hugh, I'm amazed. You never said anything to me. I didn't tell you because there's no reason for you to know. And you didn't help her for one reason. She'd have turned the place into a stable in the new place. And so, talking, they drove to the right house. It wasn't exactly exemplary either. Old, shabby, but at least the fences were intact. And in the courtyard there were even some flower beds with simple flowers. Even though it was early morning, there was noise, shouting, and the crying of children. Ruby and Hugh looked at each other and got out of the car. No sooner had they opened the gate than the door to the house opened noisily, and a disheveled Lana jumped out. She was in her nightgown. Good people, look what's happening, she shouted. Her husband wants to kill her. Hugh froze in place, holding Ruby's hand in his. He said there was no need to go there. Let them deal with it themselves. A skinny man in stretchy tights appeared on the doorstep after Lana. Who touched you, stupid? All I asked was, why is there nothing to eat? He shouted. Go inside. Sleep it off first. Am I drunk? You're the one who's drunk. He was hungry. When would I have cooked? When I stayed up all night with you. It was your birthday. What was it? Wasn't there any food left from the party? Ruby suddenly spoke up. Lana, hearing the stranger's voice, froze for a second. Then she turned her whole body, stared at the guests. Wow, who's here? She shrieked. It's Hugh and his hottie. So, Hugh, you finally decided to see your daughter. Lana, we're here to pick her up until you have your second. Ruby answered. We were told you'd be okay with it. I don't mind. A man in tights spoke up. I don't know how much she minds. Take her. You can have her forever. Why are you deciding for me? I'm the mother, and I have the final say, Lana screamed. If I want her, I'll give her to you. If I don't want her, you can't do anything. What, Hugh remembered about the baby? I guess your city girl can't give you a baby. City girls are like that. I'll be a mom again soon enough, only it ain't yours anymore. And she woke up and stroked her belly. Ruby looked at the drunken woman in horror. You're pregnant. How can you behave like that? And she's drinking. It's horrible. Hugh was clearly confused. He was about to turn back, but Ruby caught hold of his sleeve and pointed toward the house. There on the porch was a little girl dressed in some rags. The little girl stood fearfully, smearing tears down her cheeks as she looked at the adults. The man in tights turned to her and shouted, Why did you get out? Go back to sleep. Then he swung at the girl. The little girl squirmed and shuddered. At the sight of it all, Ruby lunged forward like a lioness. In seconds, she was on the porch, grabbed the frightened girl in her arms and held her close. Don't you dare hit the child. Ruby literally screamed. That was something she didn't remember saying herself. But at that moment, it was as if a tigress had awakened in her protecting the cub, not her own, but still a defenseless cub. Lana was taken aback by this insolent guest. She stared at Ruby, uncomprehending. Then she looked at Hugh. Nicola, why are these citizens in my yard? Lana turned to the man in tights. He jumped up like a rooster and went at Ruby. Really, ma'am, what's the matter? Why are you grabbing someone else's baby? Hugh came up behind his wife and looked at Lana in fury. I didn't realize you lived like this, Lana. It's disgusting. What did you spend the money I sent for the baby on? Drinking it away with your lover? I'm the husband. That's the same Nicola. And light and light with you, husband. Quickly bring the documents for the girl. So you're really going to take her? Lana gasped. And for good? You won't. When you give birth to your second, when you've recovered a little, then I'll give her to you. 
Hugh muttered and nodded his head toward the car. Ruby, clutching the girl tightly, rushed out of the yard. She wanted to get out of this horror. She got into the car and put Julia next to her. Are you scared, little girl? The woman asked affectionately. The girl said nothing, but clung to Julia again. For the first time in her life, Ruby felt something incomprehensible. She must have heard the little heart beating, stroked her tangled hair, wiped the tears from her cheeks. She wanted, like a blanket, to cover this little girl from all troubles, to protect her from all sorrows. Perhaps that was the maternal instinct. Hugh talked to Lana some more, then got into the car. I have all the girl's documents. We'll go to the district center, he said. Ruby, you're right. We should look somewhere. What will they tell us? The girl's basically nobody to me. Julia, Ruby said quietly. What? Hugh turned to them in surprise. The girl's name is Julia. Yeah, well, I just can't get used to it yet. That's understandable. Hugh, will you come and see your mother? Maybe I should. It's not very human. You should at least give her some money, so she can drink it away. You can see everyone here drinks, even pregnant women. It's awful. I didn't think Lana would stoop to that. Let's go to my mother's after all, Ruby said quietly but insistently. She's your mother after all. You don't even realize that you're a lucky man. She's alive, even if she's not. But she's alive. Ruby remembered her mother, brushed away her tears and hugged Julia. The girl had already settled down a little and looked at the sad, beautiful aunt next to her. Hugh only grinned and shrugged. Mother. Hadn't seen her in so many years. Wouldn't see her again. Come on, he'd do as his wife asked. But she wouldn't get any money from him anyway. Surprisingly, Katerina was sober and even tried to put the house in order. She was just sweeping the floor when Ruby and Hugh and the girl came into her house. Yesterday's mountain of bottles had also disappeared. When the woman saw the guests, she shook her hands. Oh, my son, Ruby, come on in. Who's that with you? My favorite granddaughter? Julia boldly approached Katerina. The woman embraced her, kissed her. My darling, my darling. Katerina coaxed and stroked Julia's shaggy head. Hungry, perhaps? Now I'll fry you some potatoes. Don't, mother. Hugh said sharply and wrinkled his nose. We'll be on our way. We'll only be a minute. What's the matter, son? We haven't seen each other for three years. Or more than that? Why don't you sit down and tell me how you're doing? At least let me see your ruby. What a good wife you have. Katerina smiled at Ruby. She smiled back. On the one hand, she shared her husband's mood, but it was uncomfortable. A mother, after all. No, we'll go. And once Lana gives birth, we'll bring the girl back. Hugh said firmly. Turned to the door and already on the way out added, Mother, don't drink. You're old enough. Do you understand? Yes, son. Her face changed and she was almost crying. Ruby felt sorry for the poor, downcast woman. She touched her hand and whispered, Don't worry, it'll get better. Just don't drink, really. And slipped a hundred dollars into the pocket of Katerina's robe. The woman looked at Ruby in surprise. Then she nodded appreciatively. As they walked to the car, Katerina held Julia's hand, and Julia walked trustingly beside her grandmother. You'd do it so that Julie would stay with you at all, Katerina whispered to Ruby on the way out. Lana doesn't need her, and I'm not a very good nurse. Julie often sleeps over. She's hungry. I may drink, but I can always find something to feed the baby. Lana's been drinking Hugh's money with her man. She's never spent any of it on Julia. Keep the girl. I know she's a stranger to you, but to Hugh, she's family. Don't take it out on him. I'm not, Ruby said. Hugh had already got into the car and was looking impatiently at his wife and mother. Catherine cast a brief glance at her son and whispered again, In general, my dear, be careful with my son. He will deceive you and will not blink an eye. He's just like his father. All he wants from women is profit. You're wrong. Ruby looked angrily at her mother-in-law. Hugh is not like that. I hope I'm wrong. Katerina Ivanovna sighed and added louder, Don't hurt Julia. Ruby, overcome by a certain squeamishness, hugged the woman, to which she was overjoyed. She also hugged her sister-in-law tightly and then kissed Julia. Be a good girl, my dear, and may you be luckier than me, Katerina whispered and cried. Grandmother, are you crying? Julia, what are you talking about, honey? It's an allergy to wormwood. 
There's so much of it around. Katerina smiled and looked at Ruby. She added quietly, Take her away and don't bring her here again. Then in the car as they drove off, Hugh asked her what she and her mother were whispering about. It was nothing. Ruby shrugged. Your mom's not so bad. Just an unhappy woman who's broken because of her husband's betrayal. Betrayal. Hugh grinned. In that case, half the country should be drinking heavily. How many husbands leave their wives? But you won't leave me, will you? Ruby asked thoughtfully. What makes you think that? Hugh laughed. We're all right together. Sort of. But I can't bear you a child. These babies are trouble, Hugh said sharply. This is the girl I need to sort things out with now. Julia. Her name is Julia. Ruby reminded him, hugging the little girl, who trustingly nuzzled into her side. Yes, Julia. I got in over my head. I should have called the guardianship office straight away, that's all. Hugh. You're not saying you want to put her in an orphanage, are you? But you were asked to look after her as a human being. Have you seen the conditions the child is living in? But you're Hugh's father. Let's just take it easy for a while. Let her stay with us for a while and then we'll decide what to do. But we have to go to the guardianship office. You said so yourself, or we'll be accused of kidnapping. We'll go there now. Try to explain everything. Make a deal. Maybe they'll give us some paper. Hugh just nodded in response. To be honest, he just wanted to hand the child over to the orphanage. That was all. Why did he have to get involved in all this? But she was looking at him like that. So he decided to play the noble husband and father. All right. A few weeks, a month, he's got a deadline. In the district center. They quickly found the department they needed. The administration explained everything to them. A pretty young woman listened and sighed heavily. This Lana has been under our close observation for a year now. We haven't interfered yet, because we think the child is better off with her birth mother anyway. So you're the father? It's too bad there's no record of you in the baby's file. Let's do it this way. I'll issue the necessary certificate that the child will live with you for a month. The child welfare authorities in your town will contact you and you'll be monitored. Don't worry. It's just the way it is. Of course, it's not quite right, but I don't want to send the child to an orphanage with living parents. Wouldn't you agree? Ruby nodded, and Hugh nodded back. Good. She smiled. Let the girl stay with you for a month. Maybe Lana will get her head on straight. No. So you take a good look at the girl. Maybe she'll stay with you. She's not a stranger. No stranger. Ruby answered for her husband. You can be sure Julia will be fine here. The staff member nodded encouragingly. Then she gave them a certificate that Julia would live at her father's place of residence, and they drove off. In the car, Hugh was already resentful. She's a stupid woman, this employee. She'd basically given the baby to strangers. What if we cheated her? No, she won't be there long. Hugh, I don't understand you. Ruby shook her head. The girl did a good deed. Or did you expect something else? Hugh just waved his hand and stared at the road. They drove the rest of the way in silence. They got home at nightfall. Ruby carried a sleepy Julia into the apartment and put her to bed on the living room couch. Look, she looks just like you, Ruby remarked with a smile as she went into the kitchen, where Hugh was sullenly drinking tea. Yes? I hadn't noticed, he replied. Ruby, don't get used to that girl. She's only staying with us temporarily anyway. What are you going to do with her tomorrow? Me? Ruby was surprised. What are the options? She's still a little girl. You can't leave her alone in the apartment. I'll go to work in the morning and take a leave of absence, and then we'll figure out what to do. There won't be a later, Ruby. Hugh replied sharply. All right. I'm going to bed. Ruby stared after her husband in confusion. Why did he react to his own daughter like that? He had gone to pick her up, and now he was suddenly unhappy about something. Ruby thought Hugh was just confused. He'd get used to the girl. And then Ruby thought that maybe they could keep Julia with them. If they couldn't have children of their own, at least this way she could be a mother. Lana didn't want Julia. She'd seen that for herself. Ruby woke up this morning and Hugh was gone. He'd gone to work early and hadn't even woken her up. Her husband's behavior was incomprehensible. The first thing you should resent is yourself. Ruby looked into the living room. Julia was asleep, curled up on the sofa. Ruby smiled involuntarily. Oh my God, 
She was so small and sweet, Ruby realized. She had to go to work, too. She'd hoped Hugh would babysit for a while while she went to her boss and asked him for a leave of absence at her own expense. But her husband was away. She would have to wake Julia and go with her, Ruby decided. She went to the kitchen, made a quick breakfast, and went to wake up the girl. Sunshine, wake up, Ruby said affectionately and stroked Julia's head. The little girl suddenly shuddered and opened her eyes in fright. Then she sat up abruptly on the sofa, tucked her legs under her and kept looking at Ruby. Little one, what are you doing? The woman said in surprise. I'm Aunt Ruby. Have you forgotten? You and I came to stay with us yesterday, and for now you're going to live with me and Daddy. Daddy? Julia repeated. And Mommy? We'll take you to Mommy when you have a baby brother or sister. No, no, don't! The girl cried. Don't take me to her. She's bad, she swears and drinks. That's it, that's it. And Julia waved her hand several times in the air. Ruby's heart sank at the sight of it all. She hugged the girl and kissed her on the top of her head. Little girl, don't cry. I'll try to think of something. Quietly said the woman. She thought to herself, this is what she can do. Lana was not deprived of parental rights. Hugh, the birth father, almost shunned his daughter. She, Ruby, what is she to this girl? She's nobody. And she's such a good girl, so bright. She's only three years old, she speaks so clearly, and I don't think she's had any special training. I mean, if we give Julia to Lana, it's not going to do any good. What to do? Ruby decided that she would think about that later. In the meantime, she had to get ready for work. Julia, have you ever taken the subway? Ruby smiled. What's that? She was surprised. It's a train underground. Ruby realized that the girl had hardly ever seen a regular train in her little life. Well, you'll see for yourself soon. In the meantime, let's go wash up and then have breakfast. In the bathroom, Ruby handed Julia a fluffy towel, a baby toothbrush in the shape of a bunny, strawberry toothpaste and soap in the shape of a dolphin. The girl took it all with wariness at first, and then with delight ineptly brushed her teeth, washed her face and wiped her satisfied face with the towel. Ruby admired her without concealment. In the kitchen, Ruby put a plate with two cheesecakes and sour cream in front of Julia. The girl ate with pleasure, not forgetting to thank her at the end. Delicious scones, she said. These scones are called cheesecakes, smiled Ruby. Okay, honey, let's get ready. We're taking the subway to my work. What should the girl wear? Ruby reviewed the things that Lana had thrown in her bag for Julia and realized that there was nothing decent. Everything was old. Ruby shook her head. What was the money being spent on? Drinking it away, it turned out. She finally picked out some more or less normal jeans and a sweater, dressed the girl, braided her hair. It had been a long time since she'd done that. She brushed the little girl's hair, remembering how her mother had done the same thing when she was a child. It seemed she could still feel the touch of her mom's hands. Then, when she was gone, she tried to braid her own hair. It wasn't very good at first, but then she got the hang of it. And when Sarah came home, she braided Ruby's hair once in a while. But somehow the girl didn't feel any special love. Her stepmother seemed to be pulling her hair on purpose. Or was that just the way it seemed? Sarah wasn't so bad after all. Ruby sighed. The last manipulations, and the braid is ready. She admired it. It wasn't bad, was it? Little Julia twirled contentedly in the mirror, and soon they were riding the subway. The little girl, clinging to Ruby, was looking around with interest, but a little afraid of everything new and unknown, and that's why she kept clinging to Ruby. She, in turn, feeling close to the warmth of the girl, the beating of her heart, felt that in the soul is born something new, unknown. Entering the office with the girl, Ruby went straight to the boss. Kiki, a co-worker in the office, saw her and raised an eyebrow. Hi, honey. Are you skipping school today? Hi. Yeah, kind of. I'm going to see my boss. I want to take a vacation. Ruby, quarterlies are coming up. I can make it to the quarterly. Yes. All right, then. Who the hell is this guy? Kiki leaned over to the baby and stroked her head. Then she whispered to Ruby. Is that Hugh's daughter? Ruby nodded silently and walked on under her colleague's gaze. Now she knew that no sooner had she left her boss's office than the whole office would know that Ruby had come to the office with her daughter from her husband's mistress. It was her own fault, though. 
She had poured her heart out to Kiki, told her about Lana, about the girl, and about the fact that they wanted to take the little girl for a while. I didn't expect Kiki to be such a gossip. But she spread what Ruby told her around the office. The receptionist at the boss's office also looked surprised at the newcomers. Mrs. Ruby, who is this child? You know children aren't supposed to be here. I know, Ruby explained softly. But there was no one to leave the girl with. I need to speak to Mr. Joe about this right away. I don't know if he'll accept you, the secretary said skeptically. And he has to be at the hospital in an hour. He'll be on his way right away. Is the chief sick? Ruby was worried. I don't know, answered the receptionist. Well, try asking, and maybe there'll be a minute for you. Ruby knocked on the boss's office door. She went in. Joe saw her in the doorway and waved her in. Ruby went in with Julia, who timidly pressed herself against the woman's leg. Mr. Joe was sitting at the desk. She noted that the boss didn't look well. She hadn't seen him in probably a week. And now it seemed that he had lost a little weight, slimmed down. Mrs. Ruby, hello. Is it something urgent? The warden asked. Mr. Joe, yes, I need a leave of absence. I'm sorry I'm talking to you and not the head of accounts, but she'll send it to you anyway. I need it now. I have a baby. A baby, Joe repeated in surprise. Oh yeah, I heard about your story. Did Kiki do it? Ruby smiled sadly. The warden said nothing. He twirled a ballpoint pen thoughtfully in his hands. Ruby waited tensely. Yes, all right. Go ahead and do the paperwork and I'll sign your application. But you do remember that the quarterly report is coming up, don't you? I think it'll all work out before the quarterly report. I have a father. He'll look after the girl afterwards. So you and Hugh are keeping the baby in the family forever? Ruby shrugged her shoulders. Of course, she wanted to say yes, but it was all very vague. From the chief's office, Ruby went with the girl to the accounting department, where she drew up all the documents. The chief accountant, Valentina, of course, shook her lips, but agreed to let her subordinate go, since the chief authorized it. Did you hear about Joe? Kiki whispered in Ruby's ear. They say he's seriously ill, his secretary blabbed. We'll probably have a change of management soon. What are you talking about? Ruby gasped. And who's that? His wife. Oh, we're all going to be crying with her. Ruby didn't answer. She'd only seen Joe's wife a couple of times. She remembered that she was a large, unpleasant lady, older than the boss. Yeah, God forbid if she became at the helm of the company. Though it was really to be expected. After all, the business, in fact, belonged to her, inherited from her father, and her husband just managed everything. The boss was great. Ruby liked that he was always fair, never raised his voice, and very kind in a human way. I wish Mr. Joe didn't have anything serious going on. Ruby said goodbye to everyone in the accounting office and, taking Julia in her arms, went to her husband's office. The little girl sat in her arms, contented. The aunts in the accounting office gave her a chocolate bar and an apple. They also gave her a notebook. They went into Hugh's office. He was just studying a document. Ruby? Hugh was surprised to see his wife. Why did you bring the girl here? Who would I leave her with? She's just a little girl. Here, I've written a leave of absence. I'm going shopping with Julia. What for? We're going to get some things for Julia. Ruby, why waste money? Hugh wrinkled his nose in distaste. I'm helping her mother anyway. But you should have seen the old things she brought with the girl. I've got to change the little girl's clothes. She's such a beauty, isn't she? Ruby smiled at Julia and kissed her soft cheek. The girl smiled shyly and looked at Hugh warily, a little apprehensively. She did not know him yet. Hugh, however, was not anxious to show any sign of attention to his daughter. He frowned again. He said he had a lot to do. Good. Ruby smiled peacefully and looked at the little girl. Well, Julie, shall we go to the store? Let's not bother Daddy, let's not bother Daddy, Julie repeated. Ruby took the girl in her arms again and left the office. Hugh didn't even say goodbye to them. He was absorbed in his work. In the children's clothing store, Ruby bought many beautiful outfits for Julia, a dress and blouses and pants. And they also bought a lot of all kinds of hairpins, rubber bands. In addition, they took a doll with a height a little lower than Julia herself. Just noticed how the girl looks at her, but does not dare to ask. In fact, Ruby noticed that Julia didn't ask for anything. 
She was very shy, apparently not used to being bought anything at all. It was only when they were leaving the store that the little girl whispered, Aunt Ruby, is all this for me, for you, honey, for you? Ruby laughed. She felt so good. She hadn't realized that buying baby things was such a fun thing to do, and it felt good to give them as gifts. Julia smiled happily when she heard the answer. She liked this beautiful aunt more and more, who was not like her mother, who was always yelling. They returned home from the store and met Boris and Sarah at the entrance. They already knew that the daughter and son-in-law had gone to pick up the child, so they decided to come and see who they had brought. Boris didn't like the idea of his daughter temporarily taking care of someone else's girl. But did anyone listen to him? Sarah, on the other hand, was very eager to meet the little girl. She was already calling her her granddaughter. Is she your granddaughter? Boris was angry. She's a complete stranger to us. But Sarah just waved him off. What was the child's fault? And now, seeing the girl at home, both Boris and Sarah involuntarily smiled. Julia was like an angel. Hello, granddaughter. Boris was the first to speak. He handed the girl a stuffed bunny. Here, we caught it on the road. Julia clapped her eyes, pressed the toy to herself, and smiled shyly back. Sarah only grinned. Why was Boris angry? The first one recognized the girl. And then in the apartment, Boris played with Julia with ecstasy. They built houses out of chairs, and played hide-and-seek, and built a pyramid out of books. Sarah helped them with pleasure. Ruby cooked dinner and occasionally looked into the room and smiled. They played as if they had known each other for a long time. Yes, apparently Boris just wants to be a grandfather. But his daughter couldn't make him happy. And then it just happened. After lunch, Julia started to get cranky. Ruby put her to bed. Father and Sarah went home. Daughter, you should bring her home more often, father said on the doorstep. She's a wonderful girl. In the evening, Hugh came home from work. Even though Ruby had put away the scattered toys, the house was still not in the perfect order it had been before. And Hugh didn't like that at first. What's this mess? He began to say to Ruby almost from the doorstep. There's nowhere to put his foot. What's all this stuff? Oh, pyramids. Ruby smiled peacefully. Julia and I hadn't noticed. Didn't notice? Hugh grumbled. They've made a stable out of the apartment. Did you at least make dinner? Of course, darling. We've got cutlets and potatoes tonight, just like in the canteen. The cutlets are obviously store-bought. The husband grumbled again. You could have cooked chops or fried chicken. Sorry, I didn't have time. You know, it's the first day Julia and I have been together. My parents were visiting. The day just kind of flew by. And the patties are store-bought, but they're good. Julia and I have tried them before. You mean you ate without waiting for your host? Hugh, I don't know why you're so angry. Ruby was beginning to run out of patience, too. Why is he blaming her for everything anyway? She looks after the baby and all she gets in return is complaints. Hugh didn't say anything to her. He went to the kitchen, made himself a sandwich, and went into the room that had been converted into an office. A minute later he came out screaming, Ruby! Ruby! Look what that wretch has done! Julia shuddered when she heard the shout and huddled in the corner of the sofa. She didn't think it was possible to scream so terribly in here, did she? Ruby was just ironing things. Don't be afraid, little one. She smiled affectionately at Julia and was just about to leave the room and tell Hugh not to shout like that when her husband burst into the living room. There. That's what she's done, he shouted, waving some piece of paper in front of Ruby's nose. What's this? she asked calmly, standing up, blocking the girl's view. That contract with the suppliers. I left it at home. It's been lying quietly on my desk for days. I wanted to study it properly today. What did she do? He turned the contract backwards. It had a beautiful gouache smudge on it. Gouache, by the way, they'd bought at the children's store today. And brushes. When had Julia been in Hugh's office? Apparently when Ruby went into the kitchen to do her chores. Why did you do that? Hugh loomed over the girl. Don't shout at her. Ruby stood up for her. It was your own fault. You knew there was a child in the house and you left your papers everywhere. You stayed home with her and you were supposed to keep an eye on her. And I did. Have you forgotten that Julia is your daughter and she's only three years old? Hugh, what's the big deal? Just print out a new document and that's it. 
Are you going to tell me what to do in my own house? This apartment is as much yours as it is mine. In case you've forgotten, it was my father who gave us the money for the down payment on the mortgage. And now I'm supposed to owe him for the rest of my life? Who pays the mortgage every month, me or your dad? Hugh. I don't understand you. What's gotten into you? You're collecting everything. He wanted to say something else, but he didn't. Just cluck it and went back into his office. Scared. Ruby sat down on the cooch and put her arm around Julia. Don't be scared, little one. Everything's going to be all right. Daddy's just in a bad mood. It happens. Oh, and one more thing. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. Don't go into his office and never take any paper off his desk. If you need it to draw on, ask me, okay? I will. Julia nodded and threw herself around Ruby's neck. Then she whispered almost in her ear, Aunt Ruby, can you be my mom? Ruby looked at the girl confusedly and said nothing, only hugged her tighter. A week passed. During that time, Hugh had more or less gotten used to his daughter. He no longer reacted so violently to her presence, and even in the evening sometimes played with Julia. You see what a nice girl she is, said Ruby, when they, having put the girl to bed, sat in the kitchen and drank tea. Hugh, let's agree with Lana that Julia should live with us. We'll get all the paperwork in order. I mean, it's kindergarten time for Julia. Why do you need this headache? Hugh was surprised. There are so many problems with a child. You can see it yourself now. Feeding, walking, sleeping, and the mess. I agreed to take the baby for a while. End of story. Ruby felt a tingle in her heart. She was used to the idea of Julia living with them. And then came the terrible news from the village. Katerina called and said with a slurred tongue, whether from grief or from hot drinks, that Lana and her husband were dead. He took her to the maternity hospital on a motorcycle, and the motorcycle is old, unreliable, and Lana's husband was obviously drunk. They went down a ditch, and that was it. Hugh, hearing all this, he was thinking hard. Where to put the girl now? Ruby, on the other hand, had a different take on the whole situation. Now Hugh would definitely agree to take Julia, and they would have a complete family. Of course, she had to go to the guardianship office and collect a lot of documents. But Ruby was ready for that. And she mentally began to call Julia's daughter Nika. Another week passed. Ruby practiced with Julia and several times hinted to Hugh that it was time to go to the guardianship to formalize the girl. Hugh the girl needs to have medical supervision, vaccinations on time. And it is also time to register her in the kindergarten. It's not the first time Ruby's told her husband. So you've already made up your mind for both of us? He remarked grimly. I've got a lot on my plate at work right now. In fact, I've been doing a lot of running around. Yeah, but I've got to go out too, Ruby reminded me. Who are we going to leave Julia with? I've regretted taking her in a thousand times already, Hugh said angrily. All I hear is Julia, Julia, Julia. Do you remember that this is not your child? Hugh, why do you say that? Ruby said reproachfully. Well, I'm sorry. I'm just having a bit of a hard time at work at the moment, so I'm just taking it out on you. What else has happened? Mr. Joe's sick, and now his wife's out. Hugh said Mrs. Mary's got her own rules at the firm, demanding a lot of things, sometimes impossible. A lot of the workers have their heads up their asses. Hugh is doing well. He has found a common language with his new mistress. But some employees do not want to work under her leadership. Several people have already quit. Oh my God! How are the girls in accounts? They haven't called me or said anything. Ruby was surprised. You've got a lot of excitement going on. I haven't heard a thing. They're all quiet in the accounting department. They're as quiet as mice. Hugh grinned. Yes, it's time for me to finish my vacation. I've got to go and help the girls. But what about Julia? Why don't we get a nanny until we get everything organized? A nanny? What am I, a millionaire? No. What do you suggest? Hugh didn't say anything. He went to his office and Ruby went to Julia's. The girl was asleep with her stuffed bunny in her arms. And then it struck Ruby. Why don't she ask her father and Sarah to keep an eye on her? After all, the three of them were very good friends. Ruby decided that tomorrow morning she would go to her father's house and ask him to babysit. She had hoped to take Julia with her, but the girl was cranky and wouldn't get up in the morning. It was Saturday. Hugh was home too. She asked her husband to keep an eye on the girl and went to Boris. 
She didn't want to discuss such a subject over the phone. As Ruby had expected, Boris and Sarah liked the idea. Sarah especially liked taking care of the baby. In fact, daughter, don't delay. Get the papers on the girl, the father advised. First, we should probably do a DNA test between Hugh and Julia to prove the relationship. Yes, I think so, too. Ruby agreed. Thank you. They sat with the parents for a while, talking about this and that. A couple hours later, Ruby went home. On the way, she stopped at the mall. She'd seen some pretty dresses for Julia a few days ago. She decided to buy some today. She also went to the bakery and bought a cake. Afterwards, the satisfied woman went home with her purchases. I'm home, she shouted as she came into the hallway. Hugh, Julia, let's go to the kitchen for tea. Surprisingly, she was answered by silence. Ruby went through the rooms, looked even into the bathroom. No one was there. Strange, where had Hugh gone with his daughter? Hugh hadn't said he was going anywhere with his daughter. Yes, Ruby mentally called Julia that more and more often. Maybe he'd gone to work? Probably. Workaholic. Can't even get away from his work on his day off. She called her husband, but his cell phone was unavailable. The woman felt a little anxious. To distract herself a bit, she decided to clean the house while waiting for her husband and Julia. She started with the hotel, where they had set up a kind of nursery. What was her surprise when she didn't find some of Julia's things, nor were there any documents, and the stuffed bunny Boris had given her, which had become the girl's favorite toy. Ruby dialed her husband's number again, but his phone was still off. The woman decided to go to the office. There was hope that Hugh and Julia had gone there. Only why had he taken the girl's clothes and documents? Ruby didn't understand anything. To her delight, she saw her husband's car in the parking lot near work. She breathed a sigh of relief. Hugh's a weirdo. He must have wanted to work, so he'd brought Julia and her closet with him just in case. Ruby ran quickly down the steps. At the office, a security guard met her at the entrance. Ruby showed her pass. The man hesitated for a moment. Michael, is something wrong? She was surprised. Mrs. Ruby, I'm sorry, but your badge is invalid. What do you mean? Ruby was surprised. I've only been gone three weeks. I'm still on vacation, but that doesn't mean my pass is invalid. But it is. New landlady's orders. You've been fired. I have orders to keep you out of the office. What is this nonsense? Why don't I know anything about this? My husband didn't tell me anything. There must be some mistake. There's no mistake. Your husband, Mrs. Ruby, I'm sorry, but he's a very bad man. Michael, what are you talking about? I know what I'm saying, but I can't give you all the details. I'm sorry again. My work is more important to me. But my husband is at the office right now. I saw his car in the parking lot. Let me through, please. I need to understand what's going on. Michael, I can't reach him. I can't help you. All right. I'll take care of the firing. Just tell me one thing. Did Hugh come alone? Did he have a little girl with him? The guard's eyebrows went up and a silly smile appeared on his face. No, he definitely didn't have a little girl with him. Why are you laughing? Ruby shrieked angrily. She realized she wasn't going to get anywhere here, so she decided to wait for her husband outside. Ruby left the building and sat down on a bench near the parking lot. Her head was spinning. What had happened in the three or so hours she'd been at her father's house? Where was Julia? What was wrong with Hugh? And why was she fired all of a sudden? No. That stupid security guard had got it all wrong. She's gonna have to deal with him and he's gonna apologize to her. And then Hugh appeared in the office doorway. Ruby wanted to rush toward him but she froze. She saw Hugh hold the door open for a large woman in an expensive suit, then take her arm, and together they walked toward the parking lot. In this woman Ruby recognized the same Mary, Mr. Joe's wife. Ruby was hidden by a small hedge, so the two men didn't see her and they were talking very animatedly. I'm glad, darling, that you've settled this matter with the girl because you've been so wooden lately. Ruby heard Mary's voice. I've been wondering how to get rid of her for so long, and then the guardianship came to me. They said they found out we had the late Lana's kid. They had to take it away until they figure out what happened. I just clapped my hands together. I quickly gathered up the girl's things, documents, handed them everything and sent them away. Let them take her to an orphanage. How long can I put up with this burden in my house? Hugh, isn't it a shame? She's your own daughter. Please, Mary. Why would I want a child from some hillbilly? It was just a moment of weakness. I felt sorry for her. But it's nothing to do with the baby. 
so I took it, but on loan. I see Ruby's feeling a bit like a mother, but that's not the point. Why do I need all this when I've got you? Oh, you're my sweetie, Maria laughed. I'm happy we're together now, too. By the way, it's about time you did something about Ruby. I already fired her from her job. You need to get her out of your life. I don't want to be in the background. You know that. Hugh didn't have time to answer before Ruby came out of the hatch. Mary was the first to spot her. There's Ruby herself. Mary grinned. Hugh, what's going on? What did I just hear? Explain. Darling, it's not proper to eavesdrop, Mary answered again. In fact, if you want to know, you should listen. And she told me that she had been with Hugh for nearly three weeks, almost as soon as she took over as manager. They love each other. They have big plans for the future. Ruby is only getting in the way of their happiness, Mary was telling, and Hugh stood beside her and calmly looked Ruby in the eye. Not an ounce of remorse. He even smiled slightly and stroked his mistress's hand. Ruby was disgusted to hear and watch all this. She felt as if she were dreaming. Her husband couldn't be such a scoundrel. So you've been seeing someone else all this time and then you came to me and my daughter? Ruby said. It's monstrous. You lied to me looking me in the eye. How can you do that, Hugh? And it turns out it's true about the dismissal. I thought the guard had got it wrong. You knew about it and you didn't say anything? What's more, Hugh asked me to fire you. Why would we want to see you at the firm? Well, this is an opportunity. You left before my husband could sign your letter. And I didn't even sign it. If you want to rest, then rest. I fired you for absenteeism, that's all. What truancy? Hugh, why don't you say something? I was babysitting your daughter. That's despicable. And more importantly, who took Julia? I'm so sick of you and Julia, Hugh replied with sudden anger. Yes, she was taken away by the guardianship as she should be. I thought they were going to take her away from us in the district center when we first came from the village. But no, some kindly fool at the district guardianship office was too kind. So I had to play the part of the father. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I mean, Lana could have started a lawsuit, demanded a DNA test, and then she'd have to pay the full price. So she settled for two or three hundred a month. She was happy. You said you paid her more. Ruby was confused. I always knew you were a gullible fool. You'd believe anything, and then it's okay. Lana's gone to the afterlife. Ha! Now no one can say the baby's mine. Alcoholic mom doesn't count. You? Who's gonna listen to you? I wasn't gonna admit to that little shit. And then everything worked out in my favor. You went to your dad's house, custody's on your doorstep, and I told him I was just friends with Lana. That's why I was looking out for my daughter. And nobody even looked at that piece of paper from the district center. Now you're free. I got your Julia. You can rest assured. Where's the girl now? I don't know. Some orphanage. Yeah. One more time. You know everything now. I just have a huge favor to ask of you. I want you out of my apartment by tonight. What do you mean? Ruby was stunned. The apartment was bought by the two of us with a mortgage, and we paid the down payment out of the money my father gave us. What are you saying? Hugh grinned. And where is it documented that my father gave the money for the mortgage? There's nothing. Not a piece of paper. And we don't believe words in the courts. Your apartment? How are you gonna pay for it? Remember you're unemployed now. So get the hell out of my place so you won't be here tonight when I get back from Mary's. I'll file for divorce myself, by the way. Where the hell are you gonna get the money to pay the filing fees? I can't believe I once believed you, Ruby whispered faintly. She turned and walked away. Behind her, the two men were getting into Hugh's car. Ruby went back to the apartment, not knowing what to do. She wanted to go looking for Julia, but at the same time she remembered what Hugh had said. There was no strength in staying in this apartment. Ruby packed her suitcase, looked back at the door, grinned. After all, she had left once before. When Lana had shown up with a belly, afterward she'd forgiven and forgotten. And for nothing. Or was she wrong? Because if she hadn't, she wouldn't have met that sweet little girl Julia. The thought of that little girl hurt her heart. Where was that little girl now? No. Ruby would find her and do everything she could to get the girl back. She couldn't betray her, even if her own father did. When Ruby appeared on the doorstep of his father's apartment, Boris immediately realized that something terrible had happened. Something with Julia? he asked. And with Julia, too. 
The daughter burst into tears and told him everything that had happened. In a few hours, Ruby's life had turned completely upside down and she didn't know what to do next. Boris and Sarah listened to her, then consulate her, wondering what to do to help. Her father suggested suing her employer, but they dismissed that idea at once. Ruby would not prove anything, because the firm had good lawyers. And Mary, determined to destroy her rival, was clearly well insured. There's no way to sue Hugh over the apartment either. Ruby's unemployed now. Yeah, Hugh's right. She won't be able to pay the loan. We should try and get Julia back. Ruby's made up her mind. Her father and stepmother were skeptical. They weren't likely to give up someone else's child. They'd fight for their own. But what was Ruby to Julia? Just a strange aunt. But Ruby decided to at least find out where the girl had been taken. After a couple of days a little calmer, she began her search. The guardianship office wouldn't even talk to her, no matter how much Ruby begged and pleaded, so the woman began to travel day by day to the shelters in the city. There were a few, not many. At each one she'd just walk around and wait for the children to be taken out for a walk, and watched her little girl from behind the fence. Three of the orphanages were a bust, but in the fourth she was lucky. She approached the orphanage when the younger group was on a walk. The kids were noisy, playing. The teacher occasionally shouted at them. Suddenly Ruby noticed a girl sitting in the gazebo, apart from the children playing. She looked closely and her heart sank. It was Julia. Ruby wanted to call out to her, but at the last moment she realized that would only make things worse. She would either be chased away or the police would be called. And Julia might get upset. Just then, two women came out of the gate of the orphanage. Ruby heard them talking. The women, apparently kitchen workers, were worried that the workload had increased because the dishwasher had quit. They had to do her work, and she wasn't getting paid enough for it. Ruby decided to go to the manager. She told the guard at the entrance about the job. He let her in and explained where to go. In the manager's office, an old woman listened to Ruby. And you want to work for us? She asked incredulously. The salary for a dishwasher is $400. That's ridiculous. And you're a young woman. I can't believe you can't find another job. You're dressed well. What kind of dishwasher are you? She realized her plan had completely failed. She bit her lip in despair, then cried and told Mrs. Pam, as the manager was called, the truth about her husband's betrayal, about how he had gotten rid of the girl Ruby was ready to call her daughter. So our new girl is your Julia. The superintendent asked her thoughtfully. Yes, a difficult child. She cries a lot, doesn't make contact with anyone. She's under stress, you know. Wiping her tears, Ruby replied. She was like that when we took her from the village, and then we got in touch with her very quickly. Julia is a very intelligent and precocious girl. She's just been betrayed a few times, so she's prickly as a cactus. But she's approachable. So you want to get a job with us so that you can communicate with the girl? Yes. Ruby was honest. I realize that no one will give her to me. I don't have the conditions or the salary right now, and I just love that girl. Oh, trouble. The headmistress sighed. Parents do not need children, and strangers are ready to give everything. That's what to do with you. I'm not a monster. I see that you are sincere with me now. Let's do this. So Pam offered Ruby a job at the shelter. But not as a dishwasher, but as a nanny. Yeah. It was a small paycheck, but you could hang out with Julia. Just don't make her stand out from the other kids. Pay warned me. You have to treat the kids the same. And Julia will see you. She'll calm down. She'll realize she's not abandoned. And she'll start to get used to her new life. Could I ever adopt her? Why not? Time will tell. The superintendent answered evasively. The first day Ruby came to work, Julia froze when she saw her. Then, blinking her eyes, she ran up and grabbed her by the sleeve of her robe. Aunt Ruby, she said and cried. I am, darling. Ruby answered, squatted down in front of the girl, hugged her, wiped her nose and eyes. Don't cry, my little one. I'll always be there for you now. Don't cry. The girl calmed down a little and clung to her. Looking at her, the other babies also reached for their new nanny. Ruby had to take turns hugging all the kids. It was heartbreaking to see the hope in their eyes. Maybe this aunt would love him. Yes, the headmistress was right. One child should not have been singled out. In the future, Ruby tried not to show her feelings, 
and only secretly could slip some goodies into Julia's pocket, stroke her head, kiss her. A month passed in this way. During this time, Ruby received divorce papers, went to court, returned her maiden name. During that time, she saw Hugh once. In court, he was confident, looking at Ruby with a grin. As she left the court, she saw the new owner of the firm. Mary was waiting for Hugh by the car. Ruby noted in her mind that this was a very unpleasant lady, too full, too brash, and much older than Hugh. What did he see in her? Money? Yes, he's obviously got his hands on her millions. I mean, what was he under Mr. Joe? Just a department manager. With this Mary, he could be a manager. Ruby also learned that Mr. Joe had died suddenly. She had been told about it by Kiki, whom Ruby had met by chance in the street one day. Kiki first apologized for not warning her earlier about what was happening at the firm, about Ruby's dismissal. You see, everyone doesn't want to lose their job. Lowering her eyes, Kiki explained. So everyone kept quiet. And your Hugh, as soon as Mary came into the office, he was like a cat around her. And that's what she wants. She doesn't care that her husband's dying. He died a week ago. Word around the firm is that your Hugh's already proposed to her. That's the way it is. How are you, darling? I'm fine. Ruby tried to smile. I live with my parents. I work. Where? Oh, you know. Here and there. Ruby answered uncertainly. She knew perfectly well that she had to be careful with Kiki. A simpleton, even if she didn't want to, would spread the word and Hugh would get wind of it. And when he realized that Ruby had taken a low-paying job at the orphanage for a reason, he might try to mess with her here too. Do whatever it takes to keep her and Julia apart. No. He doesn't want a daughter, but just out of spite. You could expect anything from Hugh now. Ruby was still working at the orphanage. Yes, she knew she had to do something. Nannying wasn't her dream job, and with the income she was earning, they weren't going to give Julia to her. But to find another job, she had to leave the orphanage. Ruby couldn't leave Julia any longer. One morning before work began, Mrs. Pam called her into her office. The superintendent was sitting in her office, gloomy as a cloud. She gestured Ruby to a chair and spoke. Mrs. Ruby, do you remember our conversation when you first started? I told you not to single out Julia in any way. Yes, I remember and I'm trying to do that. Ruby was embarrassed. That's right. You try. But it's not working out so well. You know what? Last night Julia had a row at bedtime. She demanded that you put her to bed because you're her mom. You like to pat her on the head give her candy bars. The other children, listening to her, also began to cry. The teacher barely calmed them down. No, I would believe that the girl is just making it up. But the teachers have found various sweets under her pillow more than once. So you're really quietly giving the girl more attention than she needs. Understand, this is an orphanage. You can't single someone out. Mrs. Pam, I understand. But Julia is closer to me than the others. And there's nothing I can do about it, Ruby said in a low voice. I'm sorry. I'll try not to do it again. You don't have to try anymore. Ruby, you're fired, Mrs. Pam said sharply. But how could I? Mrs. Pam, please don't. Just give me one more chance. Understand, Julia is easier when I'm around. Ruby was almost crying. I'm begging you, please understand my situation. I love that girl so much, but I can't take her away. You realize that with the income I have here, no one will give her to me. Just let me work for a couple more months. Julia will calm down, and then I'll leave. I'll get a new job and file for adoption. You've got it all planned out. Mrs. Pam grinned. No, my dear, I don't think so. And about the adoption. Are you sure you're going to get the girl? You're divorced, living with your parents. Can you find a good paying job? Another question. Julia needs a full family, and maybe we can help her if you don't worry about the baby. That's it. Go away. Can I at least talk to Julia? Ruby begged goodbye. Absolutely not. After last night's tantrum, Julia is in the nurse's station, and she will be there until you leave the orphanage, said Mrs. Pam. And then there was a knock on the door. A young man came into the office. Hello, Mrs. Pam, he said and stepped forward confidently. I'm sorry to drop in unannounced. I was just passing through. Mr. Robert, good morning. Good to see you. The superintendent smiled. I hurriedly got up from my desk and walked towards him. She glanced at Ruby and said briefly, Ruby, this conversation is over. 
Ruby took a step toward the door and looked at her guest. She froze, and the man froze in amazement too. Ruby, he exclaimed, is that you? Robert, oh my goodness, I'm so glad to see you. Robert laughed, walked over to Ruby, and took her in his arms. You're the last person I expected to see here. Robert, put me in my place. Ruby was laughing too. It's heavy. You're heavy? You're just as heavy as you were. Robert put her down and turned to the dazed Mrs. Pam. She's a classmate of mine, a childhood friend. I haven't seen her in years. Oh. The headmistress smiled bewilderedly. It's nice to meet you, of course. Mrs. Ruby is our nanny. Nanny? Robert asked again. I don't understand, Ruby. You went to school for economics, as I recall. Didn't you graduate? You did well in high school. How so? I graduated from university. Ruby smiled sadly. It just happened. Well, that's interesting. Why don't you tell me all about it? Not till later. Can I have a word with Mrs. Pam? You can wait for me in the waiting room. Sure, she nodded. And then, sitting in the waiting room, she waited for Robert and remembered. She and Robert had been in the same class. They had been very friendly. When Ruby's mom died, Robert understood the girl like no one else. His parents died in a car accident when he was only seven years old. Robert lived with his grandmother. He supported Ruby after mom died. They even went to the cemetery together sometimes and remembered their moms there. They even sat at the same desk in school until eighth grade. And then they grew up somehow, embarrassed by each other. They didn't realize it was their first love. They both kept quiet. And only before the prom did Ruby decide to talk to Robert, to confess her feelings to him. She'd been preparing for it, even practicing her speech. And then, when the disco was already in full swing in the gym, she went into the classroom, and there was Robert with her friend Ellie. Robert was standing against the wall, and Ellie was literally hanging on his shoulders. They were kissing. Seeing this, Ruby rushed away. No dawn came. She cried at home, hugging her pillow. Robert came to see her the next morning. He wanted to explain something, to talk. But she wouldn't listen to him, chased him away. Then Ellie called and told her what she and Robert had had that night. Ruby sobbed for days. Then she pulled herself together, started preparing for university. But after that incident, she never had any more girlfriends in her life and never let guys get close to her. Except then, with Hugh, it seemed like the real thing. As it turned out, it only seemed that way. And Robert? Ruby didn't know much about him. After high school, he couldn't go straight to university, so he joined the army. And then, after that, it didn't matter. Ruby had Hugh. And now, when she saw Robert for some reason, she was so happy. There was no resentment against him. He was just a friend from the past. The best, the truest. Robert came out of the study, smiled at Ruby. Well, my dear friend, shall we chat? They left the orphanage, went into a small cafe. Over a cup of tea, Robert told about himself. After the army, he managed to enter the law university, graduated, got married. And then disaster struck. His wife died. She was hit by a drunk driver at a crosswalk. She was seven months pregnant. The perpetrator of the accident, of course, went to jail, but would that bring back his wife and child? Anybody else would have started drinking, but not Robert. He decided to leave the law and go into business. I guess he just got lucky. His business took off quickly, bringing in clients and investors. And now Robert's firm carries a lot of weight in the trading company market. He's a force to be reckoned with. Ruby talked about herself, her job, her husband's betrayal, and why she got a job as a nanny at the orphanage. So you worked at my competitor's firm? I didn't know. Robert smiled. So it turns out. Ruby nodded. I'd heard about your company, but I didn't realize it was you who ran it. Amazing, isn't it? Surprising. Robert agreed. He looked thoughtfully at Ruby and then asked, Do you remember our school days? Sure. And graduation? And graduation, although I don't want to remember it. Me neither, Robert confessed. I was going to tell you something important, waiting for you in class. And then Allie came in, and she was all over me, making out with me. Then I see you in the doorway. I was so confused. And then Ellie came in, and the champagne hit me. I decided not to go after you. And then in the morning, 
I came to my senses and went. I remembered your ease in the classroom. I realized what I'd done. I wanted to make it right. But you chased me away. Ellie told me then that you had it all together. Ruby smiled sadly. Nothing happened. We danced at the disco and I went home. Didn't even get to see the sunrise. They looked at each other. Ruby, how stupid we were. Why didn't we talk openly then? I don't know, she answered. They were silent for a while longer, and then Robert sighed, nodding his head. Okay. What was, was. But now I'm not leaving you so easily. The superintendent told me that you want to adopt a girl, but there are complications. Is that true? No one will give her to me now. I can't even see her right now. Mrs. Pam fired me. What makes you think that? She was so complimentary of you. You're practically the best employee there. No, she definitely didn't fire you. She must have realized who you knew. Who do I know other than the owner of a big retailer? Ruby asked. A philanthropist and a sponsor. Robert smiled sadly. As I got promoted, I made a vow to help those who are having a hard time. I supervise this orphanage, bring them products, equipment, help them with money. I also help the House of Mercy and the Animal Shelter. That's how you have a good heart. It's not that. I just think that if I have the opportunity to help, I have to do it. That's it. And now I realize that there are more people who need my help than anyone else. Like you, and that poor little girl. Robert but no one will give it to me. They will now if you get a good job, and you'll get married. I don't get it. What don't you get? I'm asking you to get married. Robert laughed and then he got serious. It's the right thing to do right now. I'm asking you to marry me in a fictitious way. I'm not forcing you. We'll just live together, that's all. A married lady with a good salary will surely give the child to me. And I have a nice house. Two stories. I think the guardianship will like it. Robert, you're offering me this right off the bat? I haven't seen you in years. But I remember you, and I think you do too. And it's no coincidence that we met. Anyway, I'm not forcing you, it's up to you. By the way, I didn't tell you about the job. Why don't you join me in the economics department? I need a leading specialist there. Ruby just clapped her eyes. She couldn't believe that in a few minutes everything in her life had changed. Robert, thank you. You're saving me and Julia too but we don't love each other. Maybe we had feelings in high school that we never told each other about. But it's different now. We're adults. We've each had our own lives. Robert, I'm afraid it won't work out. If it doesn't work out, we'll get a divorce. Robert answered calmly. And I'm telling you that we'll get a fake marriage, and then time will tell. I think it's perfect. You'll have a decent job, a girl with you, and a wonderful husband by your side. I won't lose either, by the way. You're a good cook, aren't you? You're a joker, Ruby laughed. You bet, Robert winked. Do you have your passport? Let's go to the registry office. So suddenly that day Ruby became a bride again. Boris, when he heard that his daughter was remarrying, started arguing. What's her hurry? In vain, Ruby convinced him that the marriage was a sham. She has to get Julia out of the orphanage, especially a fiancé. Father knows the same Robert, a classmate. I remember that classmate. Boris was indignant. Do you think we didn't see you crying? We just stayed out of it. Dad, Robert and I figured out everything about that night. We were both stupid. We couldn't have figured it out in the first place. We each showed our character. That's all. Why do I have to justify myself to you? I'm a grown woman. I can decide for myself what to do. Make sure you don't cry again like you did after that prom. Dad frowned. Sarah, on the other hand, was supportive of Ruby. I think everything will work out for you, and not fictitiously. She winked. And then everything spun so fast, Ruby got a job at Robert's firm, preparing for the wedding. At first she'd wanted them to get married, but Robert had insisted that everything had to look real. So the dress, the restaurant, the guests, everything had to be. In the meantime, Ruby went to the orphanage every day and met with Julia. Pam didn't mind them hanging out now. I'll pick you up soon. Ruby whispered to the girl. And will you be my mom again? Julia asked and trustingly pressed her cheek against Ruby's. Again and forever. The woman smiled. Sometimes Robert went to the orphanage with Ruby to communicate with the girl. They very quickly found a common language, and occasionally the girl already called Robert Daddy. And then there was the wedding. 
It was a very lavish celebration, which was written about in the local newspapers. Everyone admired. What a beautiful couple. One of the journalists unearthed the story of the bride and groom's acquaintance. They'd known each other since high school. They broke up and got back together. So romantic. Ruby and Robert realized after the wedding that there would be no sham marriage between them. Their childhood feelings suddenly flared up with new vigor, reborn, and turned into true love. Only now Ruby realized that all her life she had loved only Robert, and Hugh in her life was a mistake. But if it hadn't been for Hugh, she wouldn't have her beautiful daughter now. Julia's foster care gave her to them without a problem. The three of them had become a real tight-knit family. One thing bothered Ruby. She never told Robert about her health problems. She was afraid to. But one day she did. Robert listened to her and then told her that it didn't change anything between them. Yes, they would go to the best clinics in the country if necessary. They would go abroad. But if even that didn't help, they already had Julia. What more do they need? A year passed. Ruby worked at Robert's firm. Things were going great. Julia went to daycare, and in her spare time she swam and painted. Mary's firm was no longer a competitor to Robert's firm. It was far behind. And in general, judging by the ratings, things were getting worse and worse there lately. Ruby sometimes looked at such information just out of interest. She knew that Mary was still in charge of the firm, and Hugh had become manager, just as he had dreamed. But it was of no use to her. One day Ruby received a phone call from an unknown number. From the first word she knew who she was talking to. Hugh? Ruby was surprised. What do you want? I just wanted to see how you were doing. Did you hear you got married? I did. Ruby, let's meet. I've got some business to talk to you about. Business, she smirked. Business at work. Come over and we'll talk. No, let's go to a cafe. It's very important, believe me, and for you. I have a great offer for you. Ruby felt nothing for her ex-husband. No, she felt resentment. Even a happy marriage to Robert hadn't healed the pain of what Hugh had done to her. The cheating, the betrayal, and in fact, theft. He'd used Ruby's father's money to buy the apartment and then kicked her out. And now he has the nerve to call her and offer her something. The first second she heard his last sentence, she wanted to send him away but she stopped herself. Let's meet. As indifferently as possible, she answered. It was just curious what this scoundrel could offer, how he would look her in the eyes. They met. Hugh looked guilty, sighed and looked at Ruby like a beaten dog. He timidly held out a bouquet of roses to her. She took the flowers indifferently and asked why he had called. And then Hugh burst into tears. He began to swear his love for Ruby. Ruby, I've come to my senses. I realize I've hurt you. I've been suffering all this time, suffering without you. Yes? Ruby grinned. You may not believe me, you may resent me, but I know that you love me too. You married me because you resent me, but you can't be without me either. Ruby, we have to be together. How do you envision that? I'm married. You're married. You married your Mary, didn't you? I did. But it doesn't mean anything. Ruby, it can be fixed. I know how. Ruby decided to play along. She smiled. Hugh. She touched his arm. I knew you'd come back. My dear Ruby. He took her hand and began to kiss it. Ruby smiled. She wanted to give Hugh a good smack, though. She realized that Hugh had begged to see her for a reason, and now he was pretending to be in love. He wanted something from her. Ruby realized this, so she discreetly turned on the recorder on her phone. Hugh, I agree with you. We've made a mess of things. I feel bad without you. What do we do now? We're not free, Ruby said sadly. And my new husband is a very powerful man. He could destroy us, leave us without a dime in our pockets. I don't want to live in poverty. Sweetheart, I've thought of everything. You have access to your husband's accounts and affairs. You'll send me all the information. I've got good computer people who can help. We'll transfer all the money from your husband's accounts offshore and get out of this country. Ruby, we'll be happy. And your wife? What kind of wife is she? I can't stand the sight of her. She's a fat animal. She's as dumb as a jackass. I've had the firm's affairs under control for a long time. I've already prepared the bulk of the funds to be transferred to my accounts. It's her father who's bothering me. He's an old fool who won't die. 
but what can you do about it? Ha. Huh. Yes, I can. I've been tampering with his meds for a month now. He'll be dead soon, I'm sure. And then we'll get it all back and go. Darling. Ruby listened to Hugh and couldn't believe that this monster had once been her husband. But why did he tell her everything so easily now? It was simple. Apparently there was still another plan. Ruby grinned, then suddenly asked, What are you going to do to me later? Ruby, what are you talking about? We'll go away together and live happily ever after. I don't believe that. Ruby shook her head. You don't love anyone but yourself. And what you're offering me now is just part of your plan. You're obviously going to want to get rid of me. You're wrong. I love you, and I've always loved you. So much love that one day you ruined my life, took away everything, even my baby. You didn't care about my feelings then, and you don't care about mine now. I don't believe you. By the way, don't you want to know how Julia is? Julia? Yeah. Julia. Your daughter. I don't consider her my daughter. Well, I do. Robert and I adopted her, and Julia lives with us. She's a very bright and capable girl. That's right. Robert and I. So you deliberately provoked me, to be honest. You're such a bitch. The teachers were good. She smiled and got up from the table. It was interesting listening to you. It was enlightening. Lastly, I want to say that I love my real husband. I'm sorry about your Mary, and I despise you. Everything you've heard here isn't true. You can't prove anything. Hugh shouted after her. Ruby just waved her hand and walked away. Her phone was in her pocket with the recorder on. She was walking and smiling. She'd got such dirt on Hugh. She'd have to think about how to use it. At home, she had another surprise. Robert informed her that tomorrow there would be a meeting at City Hall where businessmen were invited. There's a buffet after the meeting. We're coming with you, Robert said. Hugh and Mary will be there, by the way. I saw it on the guest list. Ruby, I know it's unpleasant for you, but everyone will be with their wives. So we have to go. Honestly, I don't know why they're invited. Things are getting worse for them. Mary's father must be trying to be supportive in some way. He thinks the city government will pay attention to them, give them some kind of development grant, but I doubt it. So Hugh and Mary will? Ruby grinned. Will the police be there? Are you going to kill them or something? Robert joked. Don't stoop so low, love. They'll punish themselves, but you can help them a little. Ruby literally purred and told him that she'd seen Hugh about their conversation. Then she turned on the tape recorder. What a bastard. Robert was outraged, robbing his wife, poisoning his father-in-law, trying to screw me and swearing his love for you. Ruby, I don't like the fact that you've been seeing that bastard. What are you trying to accomplish? I want him to answer for what he's done. Yeah, you're right. We should go to the police. Robert reached for the phone, but Ruby suggested another more effective option. I mean, what's a tape? We have to prove it's real. And Hugh has to turn himself in. Are you just trying to get back at him? Robert grinned bitterly. Ruby, do you still have feelings for him? No, do you? Ruby exclaimed. It was only when I met you again that I realized that I hadn't lived before but existed. But he hurt me a lot. And I feel bad for Julia, too. He never called her daughter, even when we lived together. Just a girl. I don't care what he called her. Julia is my daughter and your daughter now. That's true but I still want to put him in his place so he doesn't think he's the smartest, so he realizes he's got his own way. All right, honey, I'll play along. And the next day, there was a huge scandal in town. In the great hall of the city hall, the city leaders met with the businessmen. Afterward, they were invited to grab a bite to eat and discuss business informally. Ruby had been watching Hugh from the beginning. He was with Mary. Mary had grown fatter and older in the time she had not seen her and Hugh was by her side like a faithful dog. At the buffet, he'd give her champagne or a sandwich. He smiled at her, whispered something in her ear. You'd think they were very fond of each other. Several times, Ruby caught Hugh's glances, full of anger and fear. Anger because she didn't want to support his plan, and fear for fear that Ruby would say something. Mary, too, had noticed her former rival and was throwing dismissive glances in her direction. At some point, the mayor came out and made a speech about businessmen doing a great thing for the development of the city. And it is pleasant that today in this hall the most worthy and successful people have gathered, who will continue to do everything for the benefit of people. And then Ruby raised her hand and stepped forward. She asked for the floor. 
Of course, the organizers of the event were a little surprised, but they gave the microphone. Mary's mouth dropped open when she saw Ruby, and Hugh froze in place. Thank you for giving me the floor, Ruby said excitedly. But I want to correct the mayor a little bit, if you'll forgive me. Mr. Abraham said that the most worthy are here today. Unfortunately, not everyone here is. Just yesterday, I had an interesting conversation with my ex-husband. Let me tell you right away that I suspected something wrong, so I went to the meeting with a tape recorder. But I'm not going to recount the whole thing. Here's the tape. Listen to it. Ruby put the phone to the microphone and played yesterday's recording. Everyone in the audience listened to what Hugh was saying. Soon there was a murmur in the crowd. Everyone was wondering whose voice it was. And then Hugh couldn't take it anymore. Shut up, he shouted and threw his fists at Ruby. It's not true, it's a lie. Robert intercepted him. The police arrived at once. They rounded Hugh up as he struggled and shouted threatening words at Ruby. And then Mary came up to him. Is it really true, Hugh? Is this the thanks I get for making you human? It is true, my daughter. There was an elderly voice in the crowd. Everyone parted, allowing an elderly man with a cane to pass. It was Mary's father, Mr. Victor. The old man said that Robert had called him yesterday and told him that there was a suggestion that he was being poisoned by his own son-in-law. Victor, of course, didn't believe it. But then he sent his pills for express examination. The result came back today. The pills contained a small concentration of poison. As it accumulated, it brought Victor closer to death. I came straight here from the lab, the old man said. I wanted to look the bastard in the eye. Robert told me his wife wanted to expose the culprit in public. I thought she was just saying bad things about her ex-husband out of spite. So they made the tape. Turns out it wasn't. Hugh, you're a criminal. Do you realize that? Hugh blushed. He yelled something. The police took him out of the room. Everyone present was talking quietly, discussing what had happened. Ruby approached Robert and whispered with a smile. It seemed to be working out pretty well. Not bad. I just don't know what's next, Robert answered quietly. Will they approve of our deed or condemn it? Maybe we should have gone quietly to the police. And then the mayor took the floor. Dear friends, we are all in a bit of shock right now, but I think everyone will agree with me that there are heroic people among us. Ruby, you were not afraid to stand up to a criminal in public. Thank you for opening our eyes to this man. And everybody clapped. Ruby saw Mary. She was sitting in the corner of the hall next to her father, crying. Ruby suddenly remembered how Mary had once laughed at her in the parking lot, and Ruby had cried. Now they had switched roles, but Ruby didn't feel happy about it. She felt sorry for the poor woman. As Robert and Ruby walked toward the exit, Victor called out to them. He got up with difficulty from the couch and extended his hand first to Robert and then to Ruby. Thank you, said the old man. You've opened our eyes to someone we thought was our own man, but he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And Ruby, we're sorry for everything. I know my daughter hurt you too, but she's just a stupid woman in love. She's got a lot on her mind now. Ruby nodded silently in response. I'm sorry, Mary whispered to her. I'm sorry too, Ruby answered her. Robert and Ruby went outside. It was early spring. The bright sun shone in their eyes and the warm wind ruffled their hair. Ruby was in a good mood. Robert, on the other hand, walked away pensive. What are you doing? Ruby was surprised. It was good, wasn't it? Yes, Robert said. What are you thinking about, dear? I just had a talk with the Minister of Trade. They want to send the Chinese to us. Do you think we can handle the new order? Of course we can handle it. Ruby nodded confidently. That's not what I'm wondering. When did you have time to talk business? I think I've ruined all your negotiations today. You didn't. Robert laughed. Nothing can stop a true professional. Not a hurricane. Not an earthquake. Not an aggrieved wife. Offended? Yes, I'm the happiest. Now let's go home. Julia's waiting for us. Let's go. They hugged and walked to the car. Another month passed, and everything seemed to be going well for Ruby and Robert, both at work and at home. But Ruby began to feel strange in the mornings. She had her first suspicions. She rushed to the drugstore to get a pregnancy test. It was unbelievable, but suddenly the test showed two stripes. Ruby waited for the right opportunity to tell Robert the news. 
But he just had a Chinese man, a contract and partners and so on. But one evening it all happened by itself. At dinner, Robert remembered that he had to go to the cemetery soon, to clean the graves of his relatives. I also think we should put a new monument for your mom. What do you think? Yes, that's a good idea. Ruby answered and thought about it. Honey, is something bothering you? No, I'm just thinking. I used to go to the cemetery a lot. Yeah, I used to run with you when you were a kid. That's what Robert said. Yeah, I haven't been there in a year. Things to do, worries. Even my dad and Sarah cleaned up her grave last time. I'd forgotten all about Mom. Why would you forget? You've just grown up. You have your own life on Earth. That's normal. But don't worry. We'll go down there one of these days and see what's going on. I'm not going, Robert. Not this time, either. Ruby replied sadly. Then her eyes sparkled. She smiled. I can't go to the cemetery now. There's an omen. What kind of omen? Robert was surprised. I think we're having a little baby. Ruby. My darling! Robert shouted and picked up his beloved in his arms. Put it down. You'll drop it. Ruby laughed. I'll always hold you, my girl. And then they heard them, at last, Julia. The little girl had been sitting at the table all this time, watching her parents. Julia, what are you doing? Robert and Ruby said with glee. Mommy said she's having a little baby. Don't you need me now? What's the matter, daughter? Ruby laughed. You're my favorite girl. You're both my favorite girls, Robert replied with a smile. Daughter, come to me. And having already picked up the two, Robert twirled them in his arms. Ruby and Julia laughed merrily, unafraid for with such a husband and father nothing in this life is to be feared. And Hugh was prosecuted after the incident. There was a trial, he was given several years in prison. They said he was in a colony not far from where he was born. No one visits him except one old lady. Ruby realized it was Katerina's mother. She was still alive so she was the only one who needed her wayward son.